Hi there, welcome back to the Community Readers video blog. We're following the Old Testament readings for the Monkey Bar Challenge. And this week we're in the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah. This is called Fresh Dreams. Well, we take the plunge this week into the murky waters of the Isaiah tradition. It's going to span three weeks and the first is spent looking at what is generally understood to be book one. Chapters 1 to 39, book 2 is chapters 40 to 55, and book 3 is 56 to 66. The reason the book is understood to be in these three parts is because uh, Isaiah the man is prophet in the court of King Uzziah of Judah, and then subsequently his successors, kings uh, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah. But the man, Isaiah, from the, seventh, sorry, the, sorry, the 8th century BC, is only part of the story. Isaiah continues, continues as a tradition, into the exile. And then, after the exile, once the newly resettled community has returned to the land of Judea. So what we're reading this week is the original Isaiah, or at least in part. The reality is the whole book is set up and edited from the 5th century, so we're never really sure quite who this original man was or which bits of Isaiah are really from his original day. But we're in a situation here of geopolitical turmoil. Isaiah as a young man would have seen several things happen. He'd have first seen uh, some of the northern territories of the northern kingdom of Israel captured by Assyria. This isn't the big invasion we've talked a lot about recently, where the uh, people are exiled to the towns of the Habor River. Uh, this is just a partial invasion. Then subsequent to that, uh, some of those lands were captured permanently, along with uh, the tribes, uh, the lands of the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And then after that, there was the syro ephraimitic crisis, as it's known, which is a pretty big deal. Basically, what happened is uh, King Ahaz of Judah had to make a treaty with uh, Tigliath Pilesar III, the king of Assyria. Uh, he had to become his vassal. The vassal is when uh, you ally yourself as a weaker uh, king to a mighty king who can protect you. And the reason that King Ahaz had to do this was that Syria, uh, which is different from Assyria, Syria, or Aram, as it's sometimes known, uh, was making a treaty with Ephraim. Ephraim is basically another name for Israel. The reason being that Ephraim was the largest of the tribes of Israel by that time. Uh, Ephraim was one of the sons of Joseph, and Ephraim is the largest tribe. So when you see it quite a lot in Isaiah when they say Ephraim, they just mean the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. So Syria and Ephraim are making an alliance and threatening the little southern kingdom of Judah, which is where Isaiah is prophet in the court of the king. And King Ahaz is having to make a treaty that makes him the vassal to the mighty king of Assyria. Now, this is a big deal. Assyria is the enemy. I mean, the hardened enemy of both Israel and Judah. And the kingly line of David, of which Ahaz is a part, is to have no other gods, to make no other covenants. And yet here is Ahaz having to make a covenant for national safety with the enemy. Later, as I would have seen the eventual invasion of Israel and the deportation, the exile of many of its key people to the towns of the Habor River. And then after that, he would have seen, and this is a bit, he mentions this, this is a big moment for Judah. Uh, after Sargon II, who was the one who invaded Israel, uh, dies, he's succeeded by King Sennacherib. And Sennacherib uh, goes to Jerusalem to try and conquer the land of Judah as well. And in one night, we mentioned this with the story of kings, in one night, an angel of the Lord, according to the story, slays 200,000 Assyrian soldiers and they are turned back. Now, Isaiah is a book that is obsessed with the kingly line of David, with the promise of Jerusalem embodied in the idea of Zion. 
And these geopolitical events shape the prophet Isaiah and shape his message and shape his tradition. Part of all of this uh, Jerusalem, Zion talk is the vision of the Messiah. In uh, this famous uh, section uh, in chapter 7, uh, which is Isaiah's rebuke to King Ahaz, which is now a famous messianic passage, it's interesting to wonder, was Isaiah expecting the Messiah in his lifetime, one who could restore the fortunes of Israel, uh, of the people of Israel, reunite the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, push back the empire of Assyria. Is this something that Isaiah expected? It sounds like he does. You wonder whether Hezekiah, once he comes to the throne with his sweeping reforms, represents exactly what Isaiah was longing for. It's a question that's interesting because trying to understand the Isaiah of the 8th century is difficult when we're reading back through the 5th century lens. When Isaiah witnesses uh, the turning back of King Sennacherib, does it really betray that inner belief that Zion is impregnable? It cannot be broken. Despite all of those prophecies against Jerusalem, are they really just prophecies of refining pathos, the kind that get you to sit up and change? Does Isaiah really believe that Jerusalem could ever fall? It doesn't sound like it. But we don't know. We don't know the real Isaiah. Now, this is true of all history, everything we're reading. We're always reading through a particular lens and we're always reading back into a time that we can't really fully understand and about people into whose minds we cannot really fully step. And yet with Isaiah, Isaiah is unique. It's unique because as a book, as a work, a writing, prophecy in its own right, it clearly spans a good 200 year period. The man, Isaiah, prophet in the court of the king, makes prophecies. And then later, others pick up his tradition, his thought, and add and change and dream fresh dreams. They didn't reject the old, but they are willing to dream something new. The old is like the roots from which the new branches out. The, the new gives meaning to the old. The old roots the new. It's a powerful idea. It's amazing to read the prophecies of 200 years of Israelite thinking. There's a bit in this first book, chapters 1 to 39. In the middle of that, chapters 13 to 27 are these prophecies against the surrounding nations. And they're interesting because they set Yahweh up as God, not just of Israel and Judah. And that would be what you'd expect at the time. Most of the gods at the time were tribal deities who were there to protect a particular nation or people group or city or whatever. Now, you wouldn't expect a tribal deity to completely turn upon his people, to utterly dissolve their national infrastructure, to send them into exile with the promise of later return, unless there's a bigger picture going on. And it makes sense in Isaiah with the context, context of this celestial court. But Yahweh is God not just of Israel and Judah, but also of Syria, Assyria, of Moab, of Damascus, of Cush, of Egypt. Yahweh is God of the whole world. But the probability is that chapters 13 to 27 and these prophecies are in fact inserted back in from a later time. The chances are they are a later theological solution creative solution to an earlier 
theological problem. And that's the power. It's the wonder of Isaiah, a book that ultimately we have to read as a whole. It involves wrestling. It involves taking up new challenges and not being afraid to look them head on and say we can think something different. Something that will give us hope. Something that will help us for the days to come. In our Western world, in our worn out Western world, this seems so quickly to have run out of steam. Will we have the courage to reimagine a vision of God, one that can provide hope and give us fresh dreams for the long days ahead?